Celeste was one of those games that I almost immediately connected with. I'm not especially prone to panic attacks, I don't consider myself depressed or self-loathing or bipolar, I don't really consider myself having many big mental issues at all, but it wasn't always that way. Back when I was going through high school, I had a very different opinion about myself and the world I was in. Every day felt like a struggle against my own head. I'd think and I'd think and I'd think about all the horrible truths of the world, and it felt like everything was hopeless. I was a pessimistic nihilist, and it was horrible. These are the sort of thoughts that so, so many kids are having while they're at that age. The government's corrupt in one way or the other. All the people around me are sheep for some reason. Everyone's a stereotype and I'm the only one who gets it. It was a classic case of high school main character syndrome. I suppose that I just had such powerful self-esteem issues that I decided to bring the whole world down in my head, just so that I could be special by comparison. It helped some with the self-esteem issues, but it didn't make it any easier to think that the whole world was awful and that my entire life would be an uphill climb dealing with that fact. I thought that I was fighting a battle against society itself, but after a few years of self-reflection, it became clear that I was just fighting a battle against my own head. Longtime listeners will know just how much value I put on a person's headspace. I think that that space is the only one we'll ever truly inhabit. I think that your mind is the one thing which nothing but time can truly take away from you. I think that you should be your own best friend, and that, if your headspace is healthy, it's incredibly hard not to be your own best friend. As between every pair of friends, there are some rough patches, however, unlike a real friend where you might end up ghosting one another and slowly amassing new friend groups over the following year, there's no replacing your mind. You gotta learn to work with it, because if you don't, your mind goes from being this friend that you can always rely on to just being a liability. Something that you're stuck with that'll haunt you wherever you go. In the case of Celeste, this takes the form of a sort of goth-looking antagonistic doppelganger of Madeline, the player character, who's constantly telling you to give up, telling you that your whole objective of reaching the top of Celeste Mountain is stupid and pointless, and at times actively making things more difficult for you. While I never consciously had that level of self-doubt, I was very much in a battle with my own head for years, and at times it still feels like that's the case. Instead of telling myself that I was worthless, I would tell myself that my entire struggle was worthless, because the world would still be just as bad once I'd reached the end of it. This pessimism was the root cause behind a lot of bad years and worse decisions, just as it was in Madeline. Just as the mountain shapes its challenges around the dark thoughts in Madeline's mind, I had created my own challenge that I would have to overcome if I was ever going to be truly happy, if I was ever going to start being my own friend. So there's that groundwork lane, that's the starting premise of Celeste, a challenge that you've dedicated yourself to overcoming in hopes that it'll help you deal with the depression, stress, and doubt that made this sort of challenge your last hope in the first place. How exactly is climbing a stupid mountain supposed to help us get rid of this annoying, self-destructive part of our mind? Well, at the root of it all, Madeline has a major self-esteem issue. She constantly degrades herself, even without the help of her doppelganger, who we'll just call Madeline. She just straight up doesn't think she can do anything of value, so she decides that she just needs to prove something to herself. Climbing Celeste Mountain isn't impactful in any way to society, it's not going to make the world a better place, she won't even be the first one to do it. She's not a mountain climber, she seemingly isn't even interested in mountain climbing, but she really has absolutely nothing else going on. She's just taking a shot in the dark that maybe this will be good for her, and I've absolutely been there as I'm sure a lot of us have. Taking up some totally random hobby out of the blue just because you don't really have anything better to do with your days. You're just sort of floating out in space waiting for something to bump into you, sparking a sliver of energy into your life. And in Madeline's case, that thing was this mountain. Alright, I'll climb a mountain. Maybe that'll be enough to jumpstart my life again. Now, I've always sucked at platformers, but Celeste is a pretty tough game. It really does feel like an accomplishment every time you progress to the next screen. Sometimes you grind a screen for so long that it feels tedious and pointless, and you wonder why you're even bothering when you could just go watch a playthrough online, or better yet, just forget about the game altogether. But it really is fun, so you keep pushing forward. Interestingly, this is exactly how Madeline feels about the situation. Over and over again throughout most of the game, Madeline comes in to remind you that you suck at climbing stuff and that there isn't any point to any of this. She gives Madeline panic attacks and nightmares, she actively impedes your progress once or twice. She causes Madeline to lash out at people, like Mr. Oshido, who becomes the game's first boss fight as a result. Over the majority of the game, Madeline is a real antagonist, somebody you've gotta beat. Yeah, it's pretty obvious that she's a part of Madeline, but she's the worst part and we've gotta get rid of her, right? 
Well, that was my answer back in high school. I smoked and drank the angry, pessimistic parts of my psyche away for a couple of years, just like Madeline did before the game's events. It worked for a while, I started feeling a bit better about the world and myself. Finally, I wasn't so stuck in my own head. It was nice, but I wasn't actually doing anything. This channel wasn't even a thought in the back of my mind, I was just working an easy job for my dad, living at home, just sitting there day after day. Well, eventually all of that pessimism came back to me. I hadn't killed it off or removed it from my head, I'd just hidden it away behind a cloud of smoke that was quickly dissipating. Eventually, it became time to grow up. Just as I got a real job and focused on moving out of my parents' place to prove something to myself, Madeline decided to climb this mountain to prove something to herself. I started making moves, real, productive, life-fixing moves, but counterintuitively, that's when that pessimistic voice in my head telling me that it was all pointless became louder than it had ever been before. I was miserable before, but at least I was comfortable. Suddenly, I was facing all of these new, unfamiliar fears. Taxes, rent, food, health, fulfillment. The list goes on and on and on. And in Madeline's case, there were just two major fears. Falling and giving up. I was a nice enough person when everything in my life was free and I was living under my parents, but would I still be a nice person when I had to work for it like everyone else? Well, that was what I had to prove to myself, just as Madeline had to prove that she herself could do something difficult and come out on top. Why risk it, I kept asking myself. What if you just become a total asshole and lose everything that you do like about yourself, all for some egotistical demand for more personal fulfillment? Thinking about all of the new problems I was signing up for, there were a million times I came within inches of talking myself out of it and just resigning to living with my parents for another 10 years. And likewise, even Madeline starts doubting herself and questioning why she's bothering to do all of this. And I don't mean Madeline is saying these things, Madeline says them too. But in spite of being scared, in spite of having panic attacks, in spite of doubting herself, she keeps going because, well, what the hell else has she got going on? If it were as simple as self-doubt telling you not to push your boundaries, this would be a pretty short game and life would be a hell of a lot easier, but it goes a lot deeper than that. When things get tough, it can be really, really hard to stick with what you're doing. Take it from me, I'm off them again, but I got back into cigarettes after my channel was hacked recently, even though I'd been clean from them for about 9 months at that point. At a certain point, when things seem hopeless enough, you get past simple self-doubting and move on to full-fledged self-destruction. That's just one of a dozen examples. Just about every time I've fallen back into an old habit, be it compulsive fast food consumption, cigarettes, laying in bed all day, putting off work on the channel, whatever, every single time it was the worrier in me, my battle in becoming exhausted. I'd been really pushing myself and focusing on the task at hand and trying to ignore the side of my brain that was telling me it wasn't going to work, or that it wouldn't be worth it, and eventually I'd ignore that side of myself long enough that it took over and demanded that I stop working on changing my life. It's no different than Madeline stopping the ski lift and giving Madeline her worst panic attack in the game, or straight up attacking Madeline with lasers or throwing her off a cliff. I kept trying to be perfect, I wanted to just pretend that this bad side of me didn't exist, and that bad side would always retaliate in a drastic way, just as Madeline tries to straight up abandon Madeline, delete her from her mind, and Madeline, well, throws her off a cliff in retaliation, costing her so much of her progress. Here's the thing about Madeline, and my other half too. Even in the previous paragraph, I inadvertently proved that I'm still working on applying this game's lesson to my own life. I kept calling this force that keeps me from pushing myself my other half. I keep on acting like it's its own entity, separate from me. I keep on blaming it. I'm either trying to shut it out and pretend I'm something I'm not, or I'm saying that it's the reason I can't get out of bed some mornings. It can't possibly be my fault, it's just this bad part of myself that I need to get rid of. I'm acting like it's a thinking, feeling thing that just wants to see me fail. By distancing myself from any accountability for my failures, I'm just doing the exact same thing I was doing back when I used to try and silence that voice chemically. I'm doing exactly what Madeline was doing when she decided to climb this mountain in the first place. She wanted to get rid of that part of herself. She was hoping she could climb Celeste Mountain and leave a part of herself stranded there. That just isn't how it works. You can't just get rid of a part of your mind. I don't care if you use recreational drugs or hobbies or antidepressants or a sex change or education or whatever else might have the power to change your life. It's impossible to just delete a part of your mind that encourages negative behavior. No matter what you do, you have to live with it. You can dampen its effects with some of what I listed above, but ultimately there's no changing that fact. You're stuck with it just as much as it's stuck with you. I've made progress and lost progress here a bunch of times over the course of my life. 
The fact that I still regress so hard from time to time shows how far I have to go. But Madeline, in the final hours of this game, finally accepts something big. This part of her, who I think we should stop calling Badeline, is just scared. She isn't destroying Madeline's chances at climbing the mountain just to spite her. She's doing it because she's scared that Madeline's going to change her life. Like myself back in my smoking days, Madeline was miserable, but at least she was comfortable. And that's what the other part of her was so scared of losing. She's trying to save Madeline from making her situation even worse. Madeline doesn't lay in bed all day drinking because she hates herself. She does it because that part of her is too scared to try anything else. So what on earth can Madeline and myself do about this? Well, it's all about acceptance. We need to try and understand why we do so many self-destructive things. We need to figure out exactly what is holding us back. We need to learn that we can't just overcome these self-destructive tendencies by being strong. That isn't something we can keep up forever, and we will relapse someday if strength is all we have to rely on. Instead, we need to learn how to negotiate with these fears. Don't just shut them out. It won't last. Understand them. Don't try to change yourself. Learn what truly makes you tick, so that you can be the best you that you can be. This is something that I thought I did right around the time I stopped feeling so cynical about the world as I moved on from high school, but that was only the first step. I've always taken so much pride in understanding myself and being in touch with my emotions, but if I truly understood myself, it wouldn't take so little for me to relapse and go eat food that I know I shouldn't, or pick up cigarettes again or whatever. In truth, I focus so hard on my goals that I justify my burnout phases. I justify not cleaning the house at least once a week. I justify having a completely unhealthy diet and sleep schedule. I'm just brute forcing my way through self-understanding. I'm making great life progress in a lot of ways, but there are a million ruts that I've been stuck in for years, and if I'm ever going to fix them, I need to take a more subtle approach than to just face as many problems as I can head on and ignore whatever problems are left over when I run out of strength. I need to find my balance. I need to truly understand these parts of myself that I don't like so that they can't get the better of me, so that I don't trick myself into thinking that progress in one field can excuse neglect in another. All of this time I thought of myself as selectively lazy. I work so hard on certain things and completely neglect others. In truth, that term was just yet another way for me to run from my responsibilities, another way of choosing miserable comfort over progress. I'll be real, usually the games I cover on this channel don't exactly teach me a lesson. I learn a lesson for myself at some point in my life, and these games give me the means to share that lesson. This time, well, I don't exactly know how to conclude this video, because the lesson that Celeste taught me is one that it's going to take a long time to internalize. I can't just conclude this with me saying, now I keep my house spotless, exercise regularly, eat healthy every day, and I'm always out of bed on time. Because, well, I'm not there yet. But in the meantime, let's see how it works out for Madeline. Well, as Madeline climbs the peak with the help of her other half, I think the really interesting stuff starts at 1500 feet. We start climbing up and Madeline convinces her other half to apologize for being so mean to Mr. Oshida earlier in the game. In other words, Madeline understands this other part of herself well enough now that she's starting to figure out why she did so many self-destructive things in her past. At 2000 feet, we see just how much stronger she's become because of this. She starts to question if climbing this mountain is too dangerous after all, and her other half convinced her that she can do it. She's so fortified by this new understanding of herself that she isn't so easily scared off by challenges. At this point, she's healthier than she's been at any other point in the game. Hell, she's healthier than I am right now. And then, at 2500 feet, Madeline reflects on how glad she is that this whole thing happened. Her and her other half are in complete agreement that things were totally broken before, and they're hopeful for the future that they're about to live, even if they fail. They're happy to be trying to do something big together, for the first time. Then, finally, Madeline makes it to the top. And, at the end of the base game, like everyone should be, like I hope I'll someday be, like you should strive to be, Madeline is her own best friend.
Before I head out for the week and get to replaying Halo 3 ODST, I'd just like to verbally thank my patrons, especially those who are donating $10 or more monthly, such as Almost Dead Again, Anatoly Volnov, Andrew Melnick, Benny, Big Time Jim, Bobby Blitz, CJ Keen, Christopher Pinar, Colin Gajic, Cosmo Borski, Darius Fazier, David Kaiser, Dominic Johan, Duncan Bristow, Freylum, Giles Backers, Idubs, IJK, Jack Eisenberg, Jano, Kale Graybill, Crit, Leffy, Mellow, Mixer Rules, Neurofilter, Raptor, Scotty from Marketing, CeeLo, Tanman, Vladimir's Nordholm, William T, Yemen Shi, Zyro Obli, Vivian Cox, Keen Vo, Zoe Nish, Ada Avery, Robert, and Antoine Deguet. This was a really fun video for me to make, I'm super happy with how this one turned out. But it took me a long time to actually play this game, so if you guys have any suggestions for games for me to play, then, uh, you know, just hit me up in the Discord. Thanks, guys. Have a good week.